everyone. My name is Jesse Chason with Lisa Blanchard as the host of Airing Addiction. I share often my journey started on this campus. I got sober as a client here, just like you. I really do see phenomenal change. Always hope. I've seen situations that on the surface look impossible become possible. Doing this podcast is to share those recovery stories, be honest about what the challenges are and have some real conversations, but kind of share that out on the, the airwaves. Ready to today's episode of Airing Addiction. If you're watching us live on Facebook or listening to us shortly after this gets released to podcast land, you'll know that we're only days away from the Christmas and New Year's holidays. Um, so I want to start us off with some gratitude for this podcast. It's one of kind of my favorite hours of every month. Um, or as often as we get to um, get to share this podcast. So I really do know um, that this can be a challenging time, right? We ourselves had check challenges just trying to get going today, um, but we figured it out. Um, and I know that this can sometimes be a hard, um, you know, a few weeks, a hard month, a hard time for individuals working towards or in recovery or their loved ones. So I just want to recognize that before we get started. But we are here to share, um, you know, a recovery story today and share some hope with all of you. So hopefully that that helps. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jesse to introduce our guest today. Thanks, Lisa, and happy holidays, Lisa and James behind the scenes, and certainly Teddy, happy holidays. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to have Teddy on here today, um, but before I get to introduce him, I, I just want to uh, sort of uh, say the same that, that Lisa said in a, in a bit of a different way. You know, you touched on hope, and, and that seems to be, I, I promise everyone listening, if you're listening live or recorded, we don't plan on bringing up hope it just naturally happens i think every every podcast at some point and and now i think we're just getting out of the way in the intro but you know the the hope that the holidays can be a time of gratitude like lisa said a time of reflection certainly speaking personally a time of thinking back to the the previous year and everything in recovery that um has been a gift Gift, a, a true gift and a pleasure. And, and um, uh, Teddy is one of those gifts. I've had the pleasure and real honor of knowing Teddy for quite some time now, uh, years. And when we were looking for a guest for December to share some hope, some experience, strength, and hope of their personal recovery journey, uh, it was a no brainer to reach out to Teddy and ask him to come on. So, uh, with that, Teddy, uh, please feel free to introduce yourself and start off by sharing as much as your story as, as you wish to share with everyone. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys for the, uh, for the intro. Appreciate that. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> you know, obviously I know Jesse, nice to meet you guys as well. Um, I, uh, I'm originally from Western Massachusetts. Um, the, uh, the Berkshires, the, uh, you know, couple, three, four small towns right on the border um, of New York state. Grew up there pretty much my whole life. Um, pretty normal, pretty normal childhood. Like nothing, uh, you know, nothing, you know, stood out. No real, you know, uh, like hardships. In fact, probably the other direction for that. But, um, you know, as I got older, um, drinking and um Drinking and drugging were, am I allowed to swear on this too? I didn't know, but I'm going to try to keep it as clean as possible, just so you know. But anyways, so growing up, right, um, you know, nothing really abnormal. But what I did notice is that when I was like preteen, maybe like seventh, eighth, ninth grade, I started smoking. I started smoking pot and, and, and using a little bit. And what I did notice is that it like took um, seniority over like every other aspect of my life, right? So like I was really into playing soccer um, baseball sports, like really into it. And then like, as soon as I found, um, as soon as I like found like smoking and drinking probably in like seventh or eighth grade, it was like, it, it was like, um, I was immediately compulsive about it. I didn't like see it at the time. Right. But like hindsight's 2020. Right. So like, I look back now and I'm like, yeah, like that was like some, some real clear road signs that I was to have a issue in the future. 
But um, point being, right, is that um, like it just it got worse and worse from there, right? And um, at first it was like you know I just like to drink, I like to smoke, da 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 da. And then um, towards when I was probably like fifteen, freshman in in high school. I realized like it was, it was becoming an issue because what would happen is like, I stopped caring about sports. Um, I started getting in trouble um, a lot. I was probably arrested for the first time around like 15 or 16 for like stuff related to, to using. And what I realized was like, I was just such a chameleon where like I had a group of friends, right. But like, if that group of friends, if that group of friends didn't want to like, drink or smoke at school or before school or after school like i would just go hang out with other people like i didn't i didn't you know what i mean i didn't need to like have like a certain group of friends and basically what happened was like the the consequences started getting worse and worse like it started off with like i went to a really good high school i got kicked out of there i went to another high school i got kicked out of there because i just i didn't want to go to class it's like as simple as it was but Anyways, that's like kind of the short of it. And then like basically just the consequences got more and more severe, right? And to the point where like um like they, like the consequences went from like my parents maybe like grounding me when I was in seventh or eighth grade to then like eventually what happened was like um like going to jail and like being like like having like somebody be like you're not deemed to be on the you know, with society and you need to be locked up, like type stuff. And um and what and I look back now and um and what, and yeah, there was just a lot of, there was a lot of writing on the wall where like, I should have known that like, you know, I was going to have a, 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 an issue with addiction and I, um, you know, we all have our own thing. I had to go through my own experiences to, to get to where I was. So, um, you know, there was a, there was a period where it was a, a serious fall from grace and, um, like, I, I just couldn't imagine my life without using, like, I, I just couldn't imagine my life without. Like it just was, it seemed like, to be honest, a death sentence to not drink and, and do drugs. Like it was like, I was like, never, like, I'll just like, never, like maybe like I could remember going into like rehab and being like, oh, like I'll, I was like, I'll be sober for like six months, but like not nah, forever. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's a little ridiculous. So, um, but, uh. Yeah. Long story short was, was, um, eventually like I got in trouble, right. I, uh, I was between California and Massachusetts and I was 19 years old. I was 20 years old. And, um, at the time I was really just like selling, um, I was like selling weed pretty much just, um, like that was like my, my main like income. And, uh, I was just kind of being a bum. Right. So I ended up getting in trouble and, um, and by getting in trouble, it was like pretty serious. I always like downplay that, but it was like pretty, uh, it was actually pretty serious. But anyway, so I got arrested and they were like, it was my first time like really getting arrested. I'd been arrested, but never like, oh, like you might go to prison type arrested. So they were like, they arrested me and they were like, oh, like you can go to like, re like my lawyer was like, you just try to get out and go to rehab, like post bomb, go to rehab. I'd never been to like a real inpatient treatment facility. It was in Springfield, Massachusetts. It's not there anymore. Um, so I went there and I just remember thinking like, this is, cra I just remember being like, this is absolutely crazy. I'm like, and, and I, what I did was I did a lot of, um, I did a lot of like compare and contrast instead of relating to. So like if I was in a room of people, instead of being like, Oh yeah, like other feelings are the same or I feel the same. It was more like, Oh, like, you know, he used like that or he did that like that, or, you know, like I don't have kids or I don't, you know, like, use drugs like that. And all it really was, was, you know, me trying to differentiate myself from like the, the real alcoholic and the real addict. Right. And, um, all that really did was, was keep me, um, was what was to kind of just keep me out there. So what happened was inevitably I didn't, I didn't get sober because of all the, you know, I just, um, I don't know if I would use the word like, Oh, uh, I was, you know, planning on getting, well, you know, I just, I wasn't at my point yet. I wasn't where I was, where it was like, oh, this is the breaking point. You know, like I said, I kind of think that for a lot of people, like, or at least me, I'll just keep it on me. But like, I had to go through the experience that I had to go through in order to, you know, get to the point where I was ready to, to clean up my life. Right. It wasn't like I was going to, and I, and I truthfully, I have an aunt, like I have an aunt that like woke up one day and like was like, listen, I want to go to and get and get sober. So, you know, there's all different walks of life to this thing. But I, I, you know, was one of the people that had to go 
to, um, you know, like be locked up in a facility and like, be like, all right. Like, and then I was like ready to start thinking about, all right, like maybe I do have a real issue with this thing. Maybe this isn't a real thing. And like, I can remember, right. So I, whatever, fast forward, I was in rehab. I got out of rehab. I was still on bail for the same court case. I end up, um, I end up what I end up going to, um, going to jail for two years. And like, even when I was in jail, I was like still using, like I was arrested for a possession charge when I was in jail. And like, I remember they took my license while I was in jail and they sent my dad a letter and it was like, Oh, like you, whatever, like your, like your, your license has been suspended. And like, I just remember him being like, what, what is happening? And I'm like, I'm like, and then I was like, that's so crazy. But like, it just shows like the, 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 the built in forgetter that I have, like, I can remember like being, being locked up and just being like, I never want to do this again. And then like a week later, just doing it again. And it's, it's just such a, it's just so it's unbelievable. The, the disease of addiction, it really is. Um, so anyways, long story short, enough of the stories about me using long story short, I was ready to be released. I had a, 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 like I said, that was from Worcester area. I was currently in Pittsfield. And she had been sober for some years and she knew somebody in a program and the guy really stuck his arm out for me and wrote a letter to, um, wrote a letter to my caseworker and said, you know, like, we'll take this kid out here because I had violent charges. So I wasn't supposed to make parole or like most places wouldn't accept me. So, but you know, he stuck his arm out for me and he, and he got me out and, um, like, I'll never forget that guy because he, he didn't have to do that. Right. I had like 18 more months or something, um, left and I had already been in for two years and um, he really didn't have to like do that. And I didn't even know the guy and he wrote a letter and he, and he got me out on parole. So, um, and that was like where the, where the journey started was because I got out, I came to a halfway house in, um, in Worcester called the Crozier house. And um, like, that was where it was. It was, it was a really a strict house, sign in, sign out, put your chair in, no hats inside, make your bed, like kind of military ish regiment. And, um, you know, like a lot of accountability, a lot of chores. And, um, like I, I just, I, I needed, I'm a guy that does good under structure still to this day. Like I do good under structure. I do good under like, get up, do this, do that, do that. Like I, I do good. I do poorly under. So I, I was in a house like that, that really helped me in, in the structure gave me like a lot. And what it did was, is it wasn't a 12 step house, but it was like kind of insinuated that you need to be working with a sponsor with you know either AA or NA and you needed to be going through the steps um and it was also a working house so it, it the structure really helped me along right so that was um that was what I got to that house um May 1st 2017 which to this day is still my sober date um and um like the rest is history. And I look back and it's, it's really an anomaly, but what, what really helped me in early sobriety was being under like a rigid schedule and then meeting my first sponsor who was um like, he was just a regular guy. He wasn't, um he, he wasn't like a, like a superhero. He was just like a regular guy. And he would like take his time out of his day to like come and, and read me the literature from the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And like, like just absolutely like, you know, he, he's just really a superhero in my eyes because it was crazy because like, I didn't even understand. I had such a different mentality. I like been cooped up in a jail for so long that I was like, so like, just, I was just so, I don't know what the word was. I just, it's like AA seemed like it, I didn't think it was real, but it just seemed like something I wasn't going to buy into. But like this guy, he had three daughters and a beautiful wife and he would like take, his time out of his day to like come and like pick my sorry ass up from a rehab and like read me this book while I wasn't even really retaining the information because it's in old timey language. And I'm like, and he would read it to me and like take the time. And like, that was, it, it was like the, 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 it was just the sacrifice that like, I, and I thought it was so weird. I'm like, why the, I'm like, this guy, like, I was waiting for him to just like stop texting me. And he just texts me every week, like, hey, what's up? Are we going to, like, meet up? And, like, we would meet it. And we went through the 12 steps to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, like, that was where the that was where the, the transition started. And, um, you know, I'll keep it light with the AA stuff. Like, for me, that that was how um, 
that was how I got sober. It's like clear and sober. I worked at 12 steps. That's how I got sober. Like there, I, I don't knock METs. I don't knock any other fellowship, any other way to get sober. That's how I got sober. That's the only way that I know how to get sober. I've tried every other way to get sober pretty much. And the only way that works for me was AA um, and going through the 12 steps. And, um, you know, the short of it for me was, um, was, was like in the beginning, it was the fellowship, right. Was going to meetings was, um, you know, people starting to understand me and, um, you know, liking me, Hey Teddy, it's good to see you this and that going to get ice cream, hanging out after the meetings, getting a fellowship. And also like started to be fun too. Like people started fucking around, started laughing. Like I started laughing. It seemed like a death sentence. When I first walked into an AA meeting, I was like, I definitely rather die than hang out with all these old people. A hundred percent. I was like, this is the word. Cause I was young. Like you got like, understand that I was 23, like a, a big party or like a big, like into like towards the beginning, it was like going to see live music, like, and you know, like doing a lot of upper stuff like that. So I was like a big party or so when I came to AA and I seen the old people and just the dreary look on a lot of the faces. And I don't see that anymore. A lot of that was just in my head. But when I came, it was like this, it was like in my head, I was like, this is a death sentence. But when I went, I realized like, people are having fun. People are laughing people. Are, and that was a big part of getting me in. And, and once that took like AA grabbed me, like it's, it's attraction rather than promotion. And, and that like rings through all the way through AA is that like, when I went, I started seeing people laugh. I started in like, it got good. And then like, from there, my life just took off and, and, um, like the rest of the last five and a half years are like, it's, it's really a movie. When I look back, it's, it's unrealistic. What like I've accomplished, what, what I've like gone through and, you know, and it all stems from AA. And I try to remind myself that like every single morning is that it all sounds stems from like me going through the 12 steps. It's nothing that I did. It was nothing like, um, you know, I didn't do this. I didn't, you know, build that or do this. It was, it all comes from, from being an AA and it comes from now, having done the 12 steps, giving it back to the new guy and, and helping them and, um, and what. And so, you know, I look back and, and sobriety, it's peaks and valleys. Like it's not, I, I always like paint it like it's a really pretty picture and it's, it's not like there's been, you know, I've taken a lot of losses like through the last five years, you know, I've lost in, you know, business and in love and with girls and like with personal relationships and stuff like that. But um, like, I have the tools that I learned through AA to handle life like on life's terms today. And, and what it is, is the 12 steps is a design for living. And I, and I lean on it and I lean on it every single day. I lean on it, you know, with my business, I lean on it with my personal relationships with like, you know, my, my other relationships, I lean on it in, you know, like times when I'm like, I'm scared or I have anxiety and, and that's the answer. And, um, like I'll get off like course a little bit and I'll start like my ego, will, like get going a little bit. And, um, you know, I'll start thinking I did something and that's when things get a little wonky for me. Like, you know, I'll stay away. And like, one of my favorite things about AA is like, it's not like if I don't go to a meeting today or I don't talk to my sponsor today, like I'm going to go drink, right? Like the, the obsession has been removed in like AA. It's such that I can, I can, you know, get off track and I can come back and, um, like it, it, it's still there. All the guys are still there. I still see my friends there. It's still the same thing. And, um, you know, like I said, what, what it's given me is like, um, it's given me a lot. Like it's, it's let me really put, like, I talked to Jesse a lot about AA has allowed me to really push the limit, like on my life. Like it's let me do things that like, I, I shouldn't be able to do. It's let me like push the limit on like what, like my potential, right? Like I know I'm like what my potential is of like, you know, working hard, you know, starting businesses, doing rental properties, being a good a good son, you know, um, being a stand up person, helping other people in my life. And it's let me like push the limit on stuff. And, and like, I, I, I've talked to Jesse about it. Like he knows that like, I'll work a hundred days in a row until my body breaks down. And I'm like, and I'm just like pushing the limit, but it's all because like AA's allowed me to like, um, you know, to, to like live up to like my potential and, and what I can. And it's, it's nothing that really I did like today. Um, you know, I, uh, I, what I'm, I'm, um, right now I'm outside of a, 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 a condo, you know, complex that I'm building for myself right now. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a really stand up son. Uh, you know, I'm a good boss. I'm a good, um, stuff. And I don't even say that like to be on my own coattails. I just say that because it's like from where I came from, 
of like, I would steal $20 from an old lady. Like if you gave it to me and like, it wasn't me. What happened was like addiction took away addiction took away like all the principles that I had as a kid. Right. So like I was raised with a decent set of principles or whatever. Like I knew, right. Like I knew I wasn't supposed to steal. I knew I wasn't supposed to lie, cheat, whatever. But like through addiction, like all that went away and like everything, it was really open season for me to do anything because I just needed that next one. And, uh, what the 12 steps and, and go Oh, I think we uh, activity issues, Teddy. So, Teddy, you're breaking up just a little bit. I don't know if you can hear us. And I know you talk fast too, so we probably missed you know, 10 good sentences in there. Speaking of the holidays, right? Doesn't it remind you of the Charlie Brown special? <laughs> the, <laughs> the Charlie Brown yeah. teacher? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Well, uh, hopefully we can get Teddy back here. It's certainly not the first guest we've we've lost due to Zoom. And, you know, uh, I think that just speaks to what we all go through trying to connect uh, virtually. But just some reflections. Obviously, I know Teddy's story very well, but you know he is a shining example of what motivation and really a willingness to take suggestions looks like. A, a I would say even a extreme example of what it looks like, just from what he shared with us just now uh, about where he came from. So not only you know the 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 good, but the not so great, the the childhood the active addiction taking i think he even said take priority and take precedence over everything in his life and then you know just somebody giving him a chance just somebody reaching out and saying you know hey uh, you should be uh in jail longer but we're going to give you a chance to to do the right thing and work on yourself and you're back teddy thanks so much and i think you've you've really taken that chance so, um, Teddy, it was actually perfectly great timing. I like you're welcome to add anything else to your story, but um, you know, Jesse and I were just talking. There's a lot of things that you know Jesse knows you well um, personally. This is my first time meeting you, but so much of what you just shared, you know, really strikes me. And and one of the things that I think is particularly important this time of year um, that is just a common theme that we hear often, but I hear throughout your story is that you know, need to connect with others and relate, you know, and so even when you talked about kind of being in treatment early on, when you were working towards recovery, you know, that you were comparing and contrasting with others instead of relating to their story, instead of relating to their, um, their struggles, and, you know, trying to say that this isn't really me. And part of what the fellowship has given you is that connection to others um, and recognizing where you actually do have, um, you know, connection and, and similarity um, to support your recovery. Does that does that sound right to you? Yeah, no, totally. And it's, um, you know, it's, it can be tough. Um it can be tough to compare, especially as a young person, you know, that's my, that's the only side of the street that I, I know is, you know, being young and trying to get sober. But I know that for me, it was hard because it was like, you know, they were saying a day at a time, but I knew they meant forever. Right. Like I knew they were like, all right, like we, I can't drink forever. And it was, it was just, um, it, it was hard to like, you know, relate with what they were saying with what a 60 year old man was saying. You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm just like, not gonna do that and it's like i'm a realist so i'm like in there and i'm like thinking like all right i don't really so it, it is hard but it's a lot of that was the disease in my head just trying to keep me farther away from from you know actual sobriety you know and that's a great point you touch on too teddy the uh, you know you said attraction not promotion and identify and not compare and uh, how many times I, I know i've heard people coming in and i certainly did it i was the same age as you uh, as you know, when I got sober and, and coming in and saying, what are these guys going to tell me that, you know, I can actually use just because it on the surface, 12 step recovery looks like it shouldn't work. 
so many things sort of going against it or so many things that just you know have the potential to not really connect but somehow some way it does and i think your story is a great example of saying when we lost you that uh you know extreme willingness and motivation to change and and look you know where you came from to where you are now and where you're going and I appreciate your humble approach, Teddy, of saying, you know, that, um, you know, it wasn't you that did this, but I also to echo Jesse, um, you know, a lot of folks can go to meetings and not do the work and not build those connections and not go through the steps. And it takes work on your part to do that. And um, I think both things can be true, right? The structure of it, the support of this, of the fellowship, all of those things really support recovery. But you have to be willing and able to put the work in, and, and you have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It is true. I try to like stay with that. It's it's hard because, like, I try to stay, you know, humble. But you're right. It is like um, it's really important. I think too in early sobriety to to put in like the the effort to like a with the fellowship, but be like with the work, you know what I mean? And and you have to be ready to see it through. And it's hard. It's such a like paradigm shift of like when I came in of like thinking how corny I thought the whole thing was. And then like, not, and then like, not, and then like, like eight months later, I'm like preaching it back at somebody. It's such a, like, it's crazy. It's really an anomaly to be honest with you. So it's like, um, it's like, it's really, it's, it's hard for me to like put into words, but you're right. It is important to like, go and do it because you're not going to get it through osmosis. You're not going to get it through, you know, just sitting there. So you really need to actually do something about it, obviously. And the other thing that struck me is how you feel like you're, you're able to accomplish so much more things that you, you know, weren't, weren't even sure were possible for you, but you're able to live up to your potential. And I think the thing that strikes me working with so many individuals working towards or in recovery is that, innate potential that every human being actually has um, that you lose connection to in active addiction, right? You lose connection to that person and that part of you um, because the addiction will take over, right? It's a chronic brain disease. There's there's lots of reasons why that is, but um, but that you never really lose that person um, there, that innate potential. Um, and once you start to, you know, work in recovery, you start to see that potential showing up more and more. Yeah, I, um, I, well, I mean, Jesse knows, and it's and it's right. It's the the amount of people that I know that are like that go from you know alcoholism and, and and addiction and then you know get sober and have these like budding lives they're like some of the most talented people i know you know what i mean because it's 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 unbelievable you know that ju- it it takes everything from us right when when we're in active addiction and then you come out the other side and you really get to focus you know and you get to like you know lock in on your goals what do you want to do you know and stuff like that and like the potential is just I mean, between everybody that I know, I mean, even Jesse, it's like, you know, going, going to school, doing all this. It's, it's unbelievable, you know, the, the amount of people that I know that really just have this budding career after on the second half of, of sobriety, you know? So it's, um, you know, I, I definitely understand what you're talking about there. Yeah. And some just coming to me right now, uh, sort of like an analogy of, you know, you said you're sitting outside a condo that you're building for yourself and, and, like the long lasting impact you're going to have not only emotionally and with people in recovery, but like actually building concrete structure, not out of concrete, but like tangible structures that, that you are then, you know, providing for people. And I know personally, just a personal disclosure, uh, every time I look out of my own backyard, I look at a fence and I remember Teddy from the day helping me put it up. So I, I I do have that sort of tangible reminder that, you know, had you not had that person not given you a chance and had you not put in the work, I wouldn't have a fence. That place, you know, would be something else that you're building right now. And, and you know, the opportunity to, I know this didn't come up, but um, quite often people in recovery give others in recovery that opportunity, right? Give out you. 
you've been given a chance and then you turn around and pay it forward by maybe, you know, sticking your arm out for somebody like that guy did for you at the the halfway house. Yeah. yeah. No, totally, totally. I, um, you know, just right now working, you know, I'm working right now with, you know, Stevie, uh, Mike, Nate, three guys that are all in recovery you know what i mean and that's right there you know you got five ten you know almost 20 years of sobriety right now that i'm all working with together and it's like they're all i mean just ab- like literal miracles like i i knew most of them when they were using and it's a literal miracle but for, i mean number one i'm a risk taker i've been a risk taker my whole life but I I want to stick my arm out because I like I believe in change. I believe people are you know what I mean. So if I see something, you know what I mean, like I, I want to give somebody that opportunity. This is the chance they need because just like you said, that's what um you know that's what somebody did for me. And like there's no way you know I would be where I was without him. And you know he didn't even know who I was, and and he really put his arm out for me. So yeah, I totally I, I totally in agreement with you there. Um, you know. And I think that's such an important piece to remember, too, is that, you know, recovery isn't just for the person that is now in recovery and their life is better. Recovery really does multiply. Right. And so it really does kind of multiply every fence you build, every person you support through the, you know, through the fellowship or in recovery or every text you respond to every everything that those that are in recovery do really just multiplies the impact of that recovery and that ripple effect can be seen you know for for a long a long long time mm-hmm. i um i was it's it's funny you mentioned that just because when i first got sober i ended up getting sober with about five six seven guys and and we're all still sober up to this day. Now we all went our separate ways, but it's true. And it really like echoes because what happened was, you know, I was doing the right thing. And then, you know, you know, so-and-so is doing the right thing and he's doing the right thing. And then we're all together and we're all, you know, going through the steps, going to AA meetings and, um, you know, and then before you know it, it's whatever, five and a half years later. And the, like the seven of us are all still sober, like all of us. And we've all went, whatever, most of them, kids, wife, whatever. We don't see each other anymore as much, but it all buds from that same thing. It's, it's, it can be, you know, contagious. Like you said, it's like it, one thing can bud into a whole thing and that's how, you know, continuous sobriety can, can happen, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and I was actually just on the phone with another one of those guys just yesterday talking about <laughs> Christmas cards because he reached out and said, Hey, uh, what's your address? Can I send you a Christmas card? And, and just another note on that too, Lisa, having the privilege and real honor of being around that whole crew that Teddy speaks of to your point of, you know, it's contagious, not only for people coming in and early recovery of those working towards recovery, but also those who have been in recovery a while. And, and that's why anyone listening here, especially the newcomer um just know that you're going to help the people that you reach out to maybe even more than they're going to help you because i know for me being around teddy and those other guys that that he's talking about that motivated me more that fired me up more because these guys they're dedicating their whole life at the time to working a program of recovery you know and then getting to see them teddy to your point of you know married with kids and and just where everyone went their separate ways they're all stories of hope all stories of that innate potential that lisa was talking about earlier so um i I guess this is a good time to ask we ask uh pretty much every guest on here about uh, a book or a podcast or some sort of re i know we talked a lot about 12-step recovery and meetings but um, is there any like go-to resource for you or something that you really uh, value in your own recovery that you could, that you would want to talk about? Oh, um, like as far as like media, like uh, you're saying like a book or, or yeah, anything, uh, anything, however that hits for you. 
Um, I mean, I for me, it would probably come back to um, AA because that's just what I know and that's what I what I learned, and so I I can't really speak on much else, you know, um, other avenues of recovery. I know there are some, I have friends that have gotten sober through other avenues. Um, but, um, but for me personally, um, I, it all goes back to reading the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, you know, obviously there's, you know, there's two sides of this thing, but, um, you know, I've been reading the same book for, for five years now, you know, and when I, when I look at, Oh, you know, how does it happen? And like, does it get boring? And and I always like stay pretty close to the pack. I, I won't even lie to you because I, I, I've had friends that have trickled and have left and, you know, the, either their quality of life goes way down or, you know, they end up drinking or they die, which is, you know, like more or less a pretty common thing that happens, um, you know, sadly. But, you know, when I think about it, it's like, and that's like all I know. It's like, if I knew a different way that worked, I would like tell like my friends, right? Like, but like, that's all I know. And it sounds tough now too, right? Cause like I, so I moved away from my hometown, right? But I have all these friends that I used to use with my hometown and A isn't very big out there. And I like tell them, I'm like, like, they're like, yeah, like you're doing so great. And I'm like, yeah, you should start going to AA. I'm like, you know, come out here. Let's, let's do it. That's the, that's the answer. That's the ticket right there. There's no other like, you know, free ride. And it's, it's hard. Cause like, like I said, we all, we all have to go through our own experiences and some people are ready right now. I was ready when I was X age. Some people are going to be ready when they're X age, but I, I don't think there's anything wrong with nudging people in the right direction, you know, certainly for me and like watching so many of my friends down. I mean, this, this generation that I grew up on is just like littered with deaths. So, um, you know, I, I really always, when it comes to like sobriety and stuff that I, you know, I always go back to just, you know, going through the 12 steps and going through it because it's all that's worked for me. And I, and I, if it's not broke, like don't fix it. Right. Like I don't, I'm like scared to like switch up to be honest with you. Um, uh, uh, it's a, it's a little like, like daunting for me to be like, Oh, I'm going to go try this. It's like, all right, this is what I know works. That's what I'm going to stay and do. Right. And like, I have, right. I have a sister that's a clinician. Right. And, um, like she, she actually goes out of her way to not deal with people in recovery. Like she's like, I'll deal with anybody else besides them because she knows it's such a tough, um, you know, as you guys obviously know, it's such a tough career path, right? Like, and she does like everything else, right? And, you know, but she doesn't do that because she knows that it's like, you know, it's frustrating. It's a tough career path. And it's like, I, um, I certainly get the whole thing and, and it's tough for a, cause there's the whole like dual diagnosis. There's the whole other thing that you throw in there. And it's like, I don't know. I'm not going to pretend I'm that's all. Like, I'm not going to pretend I'm a doctor. I don't know. I'm just a construction worker. I know how to get sober, which is the only way that I got taught how to, you know, get sober. So that's what I could give to you. I can't, you know, if you want me to build your house, I can build your house. But in terms of sobriety, you know, I could tell you how I got sober and that's it. Like I, I don't have any other information. So it's hard because there's so much, I mean, as you guys know, there's so much information out there. It's like, it gets so convoluted. It gets so messy. Like, do you go to California? Do you go on like some sort of other, how do you get sober? And it's like, I, I really don't know. I mean, you guys are the ones that are trying to solve that riddle. I don't know. I'm, you know what I mean, I did it my way, but there's so many different ways. There's so many different, you know, you know, do you do this? Do you need therapy? Do you need medication? Do you need, you know what I mean? It's like, did we lose you, Teddy? You're going a little slow again, but honestly, um, the thing I want to really, um, you know, echo in your description of your recovery pathway is your consistent acceptance for others recovery pathway, right, that you can share your experience, you can share your example of recovery, and what that has done in your life, at the same time as recognizing that that's your path, right, that that's the way that you entered long term recovery. So you can share that, but also have a full acceptance and understanding that that might not be everybody's path. Um, and I think the, the best message in that is that everybody needs to find their own 
path that works for them. Yeah, I, I say it often. There's no one size fits all cookie cutter approach to recovery. Obviously, we're working in the field, being in recovery myself. My path is very similar to what Teddy has been sharing with us. Uh, it's actually the exact same of <laughs> what Teddy's sharing with us pretty much. Um, but seeing the multitude of different recovery pathways. And I know that's something that Lisa, we talk about often in treatment and for those that are listening and and maybe kicking this recovery idea around a little bit just know that there's there you if you are going to come into treatment you're not going to be forced into one way maybe against your will uh, a treatment center any level of care is going to show you multiple pathways and then depending on what you choose give you some more information yeah yeah and what you try right and you might try something and that you decide that's not the path for you or try something and decide you need to add something else to it right there's you know everybody's needs are different and i really appreciated teddy bringing up you know other challenges that might come up right if somebody has you know it has concurrent you know mental health um, symptoms or mental health conditions that need to be treated at the same time or have other things that that need support and need therapy or, um, you know, support for the use of medication. So um, I just really appreciate that, that approach, Teddy. I know, I don't know how much of that you heard, but I was just uh, appreciating your support for multiple pathways to recovery while at the same time as sharing yours. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I'm like aware. I've just, I've been around it so much now that I, I guess I understand more now that there's so many different avenues to, to getting to the same point. And it, it's, it's not a, you know, one's better than the other ones. There's one that worked for me. There's one that, and then also the whole thing about, that's about, um, with, um, with what, with, with, you know, cross diagnosis and, and stuff like that. And, and I can't pretend to understand that. And I, and I really like, I, I just don't know. I have no idea. I know what works for me. That's it. And, uh, and I know it works for tons of other people too. So it's, 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 it's good to like keep an open thing. Cause it's easy to, it's easy to be like, Oh, all they have to do is X, Y, Z and they'll get sober like me. Right. Like it's easy, but it's, it's just not that everybody's got their own shit. You know what I mean? And you don't know, you know, what's going on. So it's, 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 um, you know, live and let live, I guess, and just try try to do our best. Right. So I think a good way to, um, you know, wrap up this episode, which is, you know, full of of hope and recovery, is even just to, um, you know, what 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 do your holidays look like now versus what did they look like in active addiction? You referenced several times, kind of wanting to be a and now being a good son, you know, um, you know, how do, how do your holidays look with your family? You might have lost him again. I think you might have. I could answer that for you, Teddy, but I don't want to. <laughs> He's trying. Well, well, it sounds like the first thing Teddy needs in his new condo is a Wi-Fi router. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I certainly could chime in and say that my holidays uh, around this time of year, you know, I'm, I'm literally writing out Christmas cards here. Um, Teddy, please feel free to cut me off if you, uh, if you can hear me. I know we have some good stuff too. Uh, holidays are certainly a good time for a lot of us. They're a hard time for a lot of us, but with the different recovery pathways, I know we talked a lot about AA and 12 step recovery. There's, there's alkathons, there's narcathons, there's marathon meetings that I know in this area here in Massachusetts start, you know, usually at noontime on the Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve and last some, I've been to some that are 36 hours long and you can go at 3 a.m. if you want to find somebody, if you need to talk to somebody and somebody will be there usually with a pot of coffee on and, and something to eat, uh, and then, you know, it it, uh, it also is another gift to recovery to to be with family. Teddy talks a lot about being, you know, a good son or, or back in his uh, family's good graces after the fall from grace. And, and just that renewed hope, not only personally, but 
with family when you. And, and I think them, it would be helpful for us right to, to note too that if there are families who have loved ones who are in active addiction or working towards recovery, um, that it's okay for things to feel a little different and it's okay for families to ask for support right now. And so just a reminder that Spectrum and New England Recovery Center, um, we do run a family support meeting um, using the Magnolia Fast model and it's tonight, right? So it's every Wednesday night at 6.30. Um, and so if folks want access to that Zoom, just email um Magnolia at Spectrum Health Systems, and you will get that link um, if any families need additional support this time of year. And if you are listening in real time on December 21st, you will get me as a facilitator tonight at 6 p.m. So uh, please come on back if you would like to hear me talk some more. But I, I think we lost you, Teddy. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'll certainly call you after this and, and tell you personally, but um this was a podcast full of hope, full of inspiration, and, and definitely one that was appropriate for the holiday season. Yes, Teddy, thank you for the gift of your story of recovery. I really appreciate it. So I think this is where we tell everyone the whole like and subscribe thing. Uh, we do do this about once a month, maybe more, uh, especially around recovery month in September. But I, I just wanted to thank you, Lisa, for uh, doing this with me, me here. And, and, you know, it's, it's been a little while since we've co-hosted together. I think it's, oh yeah, it's over a year now. And, and this certainly is a gift to me too. So thank you. Same to you and to you, James, you know, you, you were both gifts to, to me at this time of year as well. And I look forward to more airing addiction in 2023. All right. Sounds good. Have All a right. great Thanks, day, everybody. everybody. Take care. Happy holidays. Right.